Good afternoon. Good morning to everybody. Uh, welcome to this mm, webinar, New Trends in Psychoanalysis in Times of COVID-19. I am Martina Bourdet, Training and Supervising Analyst of the Madrid Psychoanalytical Association. Following the IPA Fruitful Initiative, to keep in touch in the distance during these very turmoil and confusing times, it is a great honor for me to moderate this present webinar with three renowned analysts from three different regions. Juan Carlos Kalish from Brazil, Giovanni Foresti from Italy, and Glenn Gabar from the USA. Welcome to you and thank you to the IPA for board for this invitation. The three panelists will speak under the titles New Trends in Psychoanalysis about their experiences during this lockdown, which is marked by a radical change of setting, its consequences and the presence of death in our daily clinical work. Having a close look at the title, this is the first time since the beginning of the crisis that the word new, new trends, appears. It means that the presenters are not only compelled to speak about the changes and their own experiences, but also, if possible, to imagine new ways and possible changes in our future work and also in the training. Psychology is at the same time a social psychology and since its beginning, the psychoanalytic theoretical and clinical work have been challenged and in dialogue with the social changes. With the arrival of the COVID-19 crisis, a large number of analysts around the world were compelled to adjust their framework and have shifted from a classical setting to a remote setting in one day. This implies question of very different levels. How can we imagine the future of the clinic and of the theory? The difficulties uh, and the crisis in which we are emerged, the strongly blocks, like every crisis, can be an opportunity, a cornerstone for thinking new ways using our creativity for starting and or continuing to consider new trends. I hope we will have a fruitful and consistent debate. Before handing over the presentation to our panelists, I will explain briefly the format of how this webinar is going to work. In the first part, each of the three panelists will uh, speak during uh, seven to 10 minutes each one. Then in the second part, um, uh, we will have the questions and the answer coming from the attendees. But before, the panelists also will exchange between the one between the others. Uh, of course, we will not be able to have um, to, to answer every question. You can, uh, if you see, if you have a look at your screen on the right side, you have a, um, a part where you can write your question up to now. Uh, you can post your question. Of course, we will uh, sure not be able to answer everyone, 
and we will select uh, the most important the organis the, um, organization, uh, organization of the webinar uh, will select this, um, this question. So uh, I think that now we are ready to, to begin. I will introduce uh, Dr. Glenn Gabar, medical doctor, training and supervising analyst at the Center for Psychoanalytic Studies in Houston and cl clinical professor of psychiatry at Bilo College of Medicine. He is the author of uh, 28 books or editors and mm, 360 papers from 2001 to 2007 he has been joint editor in chief of the international journal of psychoanalysis the first non-british editor in 2000 he won the sigourney award for this contribution to psychoanalysis his latest award is from italy where he is being awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award by Sapienza University in Rome. Dr. Gaba, up to you. Thank you, Martina, and welcome to all of you. We are speaking to you today at an extraordinary time when we take nothing for granted. A catastrophe has already occurred and we are waiting for the next jolt. We know that we are all vulnerable, patients and analysts alike. We also know it is the analyst's role to contain anxiety and vulnerability in the patient. But at times, our containers overflow, and the patient may be trying to contain our anxieties. We are all immersed in a traumatic situation where the pall of death hangs over us like a capricious executioner. Apocalyptic thoughts and dreams are ubiquitous. The situation changes who we are and how we behave with one another. The frame itself undergoes modification when we are working remotely by phone or Zoom. Pets may appear in the background. Toddlers may cry. Sometimes adults may even be glimpsed walking behind uh, the patient. And I think that uh, as analysts, we may be surprised when we look at the bookshelves and the paintings in our patient's home. And, and we may think, Hmm, I wouldn't have expected that. The frame is further altered by what the patient is doing. One of my colleagues said that her patient was lying on her bed during the Zoom, and she said the reason she was lying on the bed is she could not find any other piece of furniture that approximated the appearance of an analytic couch. Another aspect of this new frame is it has made some colleagues feel guilty. They say they are guilty about charging the same amount of money for a remote treatment as they charge for an in-person treatment. One analyst told me he finds himself talking more to make up for the silence and he feels less comfortable allowing a silence to go on in the circumstance of the remote treatment. I would also suggest that the frame has a special positive meaning in these dark times. It provides a form of mutual assurance at each session. The simple fact that the two participants are showing up provides concrete evidence that they have somehow escaped a killer that may strike at any moment unseen, unheard, 
like in a horror movie. Paranoid anxieties and depressive anxieties are coursing through the veins of both patient and analyst. Will the patient infect me? The analyst wonders. Or will I inadvertently infect the patient? In fact, I would say in my entire career as an analyst, I have never had so many patients ask me, how are you doing when they first come to the office? They're worried about me. Throughout May and June, we have all been facing the consequences of the so-called reopening, which appears to have been a premature decision. Patients may ask to return to the office, but the analyst may feel it's too risky. We, the tension about when to return may lead to anxiety that interferes with our capacity to think. To complicate things further, in the United States, we're witnessing two plagues, the plague of COVID-19 and the plague of racism. The two plagues are intertwined. People of color and those who are most needy and deprived are disproportionately affected by the virus. It is my view that the analytic perspective and the socio-political perspective are inextricably linked, although we analysts have often had difficulty with that linkage. We're all doing a lot of theorizing right now about COVID and how it's changing what we do, but these speculations are probably premature. We actually don't know where this is going yet. When a vaccine is available, will patients want to go back to the office? Or will they think it's so much easier just to call you on the phone? I don't have to worry about traffic. We don't know what our patients will do. But I personally think it's unlikely that we will be going backwards in time. Psychoanalysis will never be the same. I want to stress, however, that despite the complexities of this dystopian world in which we are living, something positive is emerging for us. There has been a long rigidity within psychoanalysis that has haunted the field. We have been criticized for implementing change at the rate of a glacier moving along the ocean. Well, we are now rising to the challenge of practicing in new ways in a new era. A few years ago, Thomas Ogden and I co-authored a paper in the International Journal called On Becoming a Psychoanalyst. We suggested that analysis is fundamentally idiosyncratic. It is a joint creation that evolves based on who the patient is, who the analyst is, and the nature of the third created by the dyad. Flexibility is crucial. I always teach candidates, there is not a correct way to do psychoanalysis. Flexibility is very important. And analysts must always doubt what they're doing. Now we have a, a situation where we're constantly adjusting to the person of the patient, the person of the analyst, and the zeitgeist in which we are living. Some patients thrive on the couch, while others do better sitting up than lying down. Some may prefer Zoom, but are more comfortable if they look at the analyst, while still others don't want to take their eyes off the analyst. They're glued to the analyst. It, it varies from patient to patient. And, you know, I personally have noted that when I am working by Zoom, I experience a certain strain. Um, it's a pressure to carefully monitor the patient's facial cues while I'm working, and that can interfere with my finding my own space uh, to be able to think and reflect. A colleague consulted with me about a patient she was treating who had considerable shame about her obesity. When she was on Zoom, she was self-conscious about her weight. She worried that her analyst was looking at her fat. My colleague told her that she had noticed she was more open and less self-conscious when she talked on the phone, so she switched to phone therapy. 
What I'm saying is the patient who is typical is a mythological construct. We analysts are always improvising because we have to. Similarly, there is no correct way to do analysis. The playwright Tom Stoppard once noted that, and I'm quoting, the question, what does it mean, has no correct answer. Every narrative has at least a capacity to suggest a meta-narrative. I would say this axiom applies as much to analysis as it does to literature. But despite this uncertainty, we analysts offer something that is rare, a combination of compassion, validation, a special form of understanding about what we can see but the patient cannot see. Hope in a time of darkness, and as Warren Poland would say, witnessing. Witnessing what another human being is going through without judging. The sea change that swept in with the virus is having a profound effect on the analytic culture. We're all learning that analytic work can be useful and healing over the phone, in a virtual setting, or sitting up twice a week. Many of us have thought this for years. Now we don't have a choice. The virus has forced all of us to rethink who we are and what we do. And self-examination is generally a good thing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Glenn Gabar, for your exposal. I will now present Dr. Giovanni Foresti. He's doctor and medical doctor. Uh, Giovanni Foresti lives in Pavia, Italy. He's a training and supervising analyst of the SPI, uh, Italian Psychoanalytic Society, and is member of the IPA. He works in private practice as psychoanalyst, psychiatrist, and organizational consultant. He teaches at the Milan Catholic University and at the SPI National Institute for Training. He served as co-chair for Europe in the Committee Psychoanalysis and Mental Health Field on the IPA board as European representative and is now chair of the IPA Application Society Committee. His interests are focused on clinical issues, institutional functioning and groups dynamics. Uh, you can start, Giovanni. Thank you, Martina. Back to you. We have to deal with a crisis that is uh, still at its beginning, unfortunately, and uh, which have had and uh, will have uh, different consequences, consequences in different geographical areas and in different countries. The biological processes prompted by the viruses are still poorly known, and we don't know if the virus infection promotes immune permanent defenses and therefore we can we can't be sure about uh, what will happen in the coming months the country where i live in uh, has been one of the first country affected by the infection feel that the worst uh, is at our back the first wave is over apparently but we don't know and we know that we don't know what will happen in autumn when we are uh, probably will have to face a second wave. We don't know. So the present situation uh, has to be understood with one word, uncertainty. And this is the difficult thing to be uh, faced. The, on the other hand, we are certain that uh, what we did to contain the infection, uh, the lockdown, will have uh, huge economic and social consequences. It occurred in an already unstable economic situation based on uh, commerce wars between the nations and, uh, and uh, a stop or a slowdown in the processes of uh, so-called globalization. This is the present and difficult uh, situation. A lot of people will lose their job in the, in the coming months. And, and we have to, to think about what uh, uh, will happen in, in the next month. 
I have tried to, to summarize what I have to say in a few slides. Matthew, please, the first one. Uh, the themes uh, I will deal with are the social and emotional impact of the pandemic and the lockdown. The second slide is about the quantitative and qualitative effect of clinical and institutional work. The third slide is about uh, the effect of remoteness and virtuality on our work. And then, speaking about uh, new trends, as Martina underlined, I have tried to speak about, to, to focus on new tools or new renewed methodologies that can be useful for, for uh, the future work. The, first, the, the next slide, Matthew, please. Uh, speaking about social and emotional impact of the pandemic and the lockdown, we have witnessed the uh, in the in the last month the weakness and the feeling of improvisation in political decisions a, a, a lack and a, a lack of uh, legitimization of uh, and authority of political decisions on the other hand uh, we have uh, a new awareness about the role of institutions after decades of the ideology uh, of uh, ultra liberalism now the state is uh, recognized as an inevitable player uh, the authority of science and uh, the legitimate role legitimate role of scientists has been underlined but on the other hand uh, we have seen uh, a certain proneness to media sensationalism and uh, this has uh, uh, made it difficult uh, to uh, exercise in a proper role uh, in a proper way the, the 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 role of guidance the emotional processes are uh, uh, can be quickly uh, pointed to and uh, uh, the colleagues do, don't need uh, to 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 recognize to be uh, helped to recognize phobic reactions massive identity problems uh, Glenn mentioned the racism, nationalism is another problem, guilty, collective uh, guilty feelings and uh, something like a wish or fear for punishment, uh, oscillation between extreme reaction, denial on the one hand and, and, uh, and panic on the other. Next slide, please. Uh, I think that uh, if we have to discuss about uh, the impact of the lockdown on our work, we have to distinguish our clinical work, strictly speaking, it's uh, in, in its uh, uh, narrower meeting, uh, meaning, than what uh, uh, we observe in supervisions, in teaching, and in institutional work. Each of these activities is effective in, affected in a different way sometimes uh, in a massive quantitative quantitative way the institutional work the work in for institutional supervisions for instance is almost finished in the lockdown uh, months and also the staff support staff support intervention are very uh, difficult to be performed and and seldom asked for in the clinical work in on the other hand the impact is massive but qualitative uh, all my patients have accepted to go on uh, working uh, in uh, in a remote way using whether the telephone uh, whatsapp or zoom or skype or other uh, methods uh, supervisions are effective affected in a qualitative way but mainly the group supervisions, where the network of relationship is uh, difficult to be developed in uh, in uh, in an online channel. The next slide, please. Uh, speaking about the effects of remoteness uh, and virtuality on on clinical work, I, I would say that we are all uh, un involuntarily. Uh, in the middle of a collective experiment with, with virtuality and we 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 are witnessing the short term effects of deal with the long term effects in the in the next months and i would say years because the changes of uh, of attitudes and the mentality of this collective experiment with virtuality 
are there to stay they won't uh, uh, will be they won't be over for uh, uh, with the end of the of the pandemic the experiences that we are doing uh, are uh, uh, very difficult to be summarized. Uh, I, I, I have tried to, to write down some, po some points. The bodilessness of uh, psychoanalytic experience. Uh, there is a, an, a saying, if it doesn't smell, it's not psychoanalysis. This is certainly an experience that doesn't smell. Is it still psychoanalysis or not? Uh, the physical remoteness of the object uh, have changed the, the, the experience of the emotional closeness and nearness of, of the analyst and, and the object. Uh, it it's also stresses the importance of what has, happens before, just before and immediately after the sessions. When the session uh, arrives as, a, as, a, as something which is uh, seconds uh, far from uh, daily life what happens what happens when there is the where is not there is not the preparation to meeting the analyst and the the the, the period of digesting the uh, experience of the meeting just after the uh, the session and so on silence silence is very difficult to be which is a quintessential uh analytic attitude and 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 activity is difficult to be uh performed uh, as it used to be the next and last sw slide uh old problems new tools and renewed methodology i've stressed uh, the importance of uh, thinking about the institution the role of institutions has been uh, uh uh, put in in in, uh, in a different perspective but what happened so the what was called the fourth pillar of psychoanalytic education group dynamics and the institutional uh, processes uh, will will uh, perceive uh, a, a different attention in the in the next years it was already a process in on its way before the pandemic the pandemic will uh, make uh, the process quicker diagnosis uh, candidates uh, and uh, our young colleagues uh, are asking for uh, tools uh, that uh, uh, help them in uh, assessing the patients and describing the, the 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 quality of their subjective experience in a, a subtle way uh, growing on what uh, uh, Glenn had, had made a, a, a huge contribution to psychoanalysis. His books uh, were extremely important for uh, a, a lot of, of analysts. And, uh, and on, on top of that contributions, uh, now we have, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the, the uh, PM, PDM uh, second edition, the Manual for Psychoanalytic Diagnosis, edited by Nancy McWilliams and Vittorio Lingiardi. This is an extraordinary tool for uh, teaching and uh, rediscussing between us this crucial yet uh, some very often forgotten uh, theme, diagnosis and, and assessment of the psychic functioning. Then all the instruments as uh, in, in the crisis intervention interaction and uh, the hypothesis of, cri of crisis are very useful and i think that uh, this is something that we have to put out out of our shelves and and start studying again what uh, used to be done uh, years ago and and will be uh, very important in the next years too and the last item i decided to mention and and then i'll finish is about uh, the experiences that uh, are done uh, uh, in the in the in online about group relations methodologies the opus virtual listening post uh, uh, process uh, project or the social dream and dreaming matrices or uh, a, a very important uh, activity the the partners confronting collective atrocity the pcca these kind of uh, experiences are helpful for uh, understanding better the group processes and uh, acquire competencies uh, competence in dealing with uh, uh, multi-subjective setting that's it for the moment being thank you very much thank you very much to you giovanni foresti
uh, now we will uh, have the presentation of Jose Carlos Kalish. Jose Carlos Kalish is training analyst and currently president of his society, the Porto Alegre Psychoanalytic Society. He is professor of the New York University and a New York postdoc psychoanalysis. He is a member of the scientific committee of the Jean Laplanche Foundation, Institut de France, former adjunct editor of the International Journal of Psychoanalysis from 2013 to 2018. Uh, Jose Carlos, uh, now we are listening to you, up to you. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Martina. First, I'd like to say it's a pleasure to be here with you and Glenn and Giovanni, and welcome to everybody who is listening to us. Uh, as Glenn said, we are uh, living something that is really something very new. We know very little of what is happening uh, with us now. And uh, there's something I'd like to stress from the beginning, that we don't know almost anything what's going to happen afterwards. Uh, <clears throat> And this is a big problem for us because uh, trying to think about new trends uh, is like trying to imagine something we cannot imagine. Uh, but let's start by the following statements. Uh, we all came to a conclusion that uh, we can work uh, remotely. Uh, we had doubts about it. Uh, many of us have resistances. But we all came to the conclusion we can do it. Uh, but my preoccupation is that we don't know what kind of processes uh, we are promoting, what kind of psychological processes we are really <clears throat> uh, offering to our patients. What changes does this remote analysis promote? Uh, for instance, I'll take some, <clears throat> some elements that uh, avoiding to repeat what Glenn and Giovanni has, had mentioned. For instance, virtuality is not exactly fantasy. Uh, we are not talking about the space between reality and fantasy, where we usually should be working. We should be working as we, as we work with transference uh, between reality and fantasy. And virtuality introduces a new reality which is completely different from fantasy. Uh, <clears throat> this is maybe can be seen as something not that important, but to my mind, it is uh, really important because, for instance, if we are not in the presence of a person, the fantasies uh, cannot be achieved. There's no possibility of acting out. Uh, and this <clears throat> impossibility of having an acting out in the transference and makes something unreal, which is different from fantasy. Uh, so I'm not absolutely sure we are going to have similar processes uh, <clears throat> using virtuality. And I think we need to study for many years what's going to happen. And we are in this situation for three or four months, depending on where we are. Uh, so it's very short time to have conclusions. Uh, many colleagues are saying it's the same. Many are saying that it's better. Uh, <clears throat> and maybe it's easier, but not better. It's easier to certain patients who have specific re resistances to the presence of the analyst. Uh, so being far from the analyst make things easier, which I do not think it's better. It's just easier. Uh, <clears throat> Another, another thing that calls my attention is something that everybody is uh, telling that is about the how it's uh, we get all tired working online. Uh, how this is, uh, in a certain way, is more difficult for us. And I have been thinking about this. And I think that we know very little about what is the nonverbal. Uh, 
we we have some ideas but i think that this this situation uh, have shown us that <clears throat> we need some other contact that is not only the smell of the patient or even the gestures uh, <clears throat> and i think that when we are online we have a tendency to search for this non-verbal uh, <clears throat> communication which makes things very different for us so uh, <clears throat> to summarize this part of my presentation i think we know that it works but it's different and we do, do not know what is the difference uh, and th i think this is very important because the pressure will be and this is something i think we all know the pressure will be that this kind of treatments uh, remotely uh, should stay as glenn said and giovanni said also uh, there will be a, <clears throat> a choice uh, and this i don't know if this is good or bad but it's different uh, <clears throat> And I, I like to stress this, that there's something different. We don't know the processes. And I think we, we should study the process more than we are doing. It's not only good. Uh, it, it's something that we have to understand. If the analytic processes can be kept like that, and what difference are there in an analytic process that is remote, is virtual, uh, et cetera. Another problem is what's going to happen in our society? because psychoanalysis has been pressured <clears throat> from the beginning by society to avoid the psychoanalytic position. Uh, the psychoanalytic position has always raised resistances. And uh, <clears throat> at this moment, the resistances are higher, are not only higher because uh, the reality has a very powerful strength but because analysts are in the same reality so the necessary asymmetry to work with patients can <clears throat> at this moment fade uh, and i think this is something really really that has to be studied carefully uh, because it, we, we can say that at this moment we need to talk more as giovanni said and glenn also said uh, we we have to to, to be aware of silences, how to work with silences. But I think this, <clears throat> this, uh, this is the easiest part. The problem is that if we are talking about asymmetry and we are losing our asymmetry, maybe we are losing the process itself. Because the idea in my mind is that the psychoanalytic process involves uh, giving an inner experience to the patient to signify the inner experience and to make the external experience an inner experience with meaning. <clears throat> if we are unable to do that, we are losing the psychoanalytic position. And I think we are going to be pressured by <clears throat> the culture to do it in a, even in a strongest way. Uh, and I think this should be a problem, in fact. Uh, to leave our position. So if I have to think about how to work with our <clears throat> candidates, I think that this is something uh, that should be thought uh, the, to keep the psychological position, to be able to work with the inner world, uh, even if at this moment reality is, uh, <clears throat> we are all immersed in a very difficult reality. What does it mean as analysts? We should be only in the reality or mainly in the reality. Uh, <clears throat> Another point is the culture is, is probably going to change uh, after this catastrophe as World War II. Uh, there were many changes, political, sociological, uh, cultural, uh, some progresses, uh, some the the race of narcissism, uh, the postmodern culture, many things happened after World War II. Uh, <clears throat> and we don't know what's going to happen at this moment afterwards. Uh, what group mentality will change? Are we going to be more humanistic? Are we going to be more narcissistic? 
how how are you going to handle these situations in to group mentality? And this will pressure psychoanalysts to change and adapt also, even in a narcissistic way or in a more humanistic way. So we don't know. Uh, so our task here today is interesting, is is very challenging, but I think it's so challenging that I don't know if we can have a, a good answer to the questions. We have certainly more questions than answers. Uh, and my last question is, uh, how are we going to handle the this kind of pressure the group mentality would impose on us uh, to avoid, as the narcissistic culture in a certain way requires, to avoid uh, a, a kind of distorting notion of freedom, uh, where freedom is to do not have a psyche, do not have a body, and do not have any limitations that was fostered by the technical culture and uh, and uh, and what happened with everything related to consumption and many things that you have said that we can uh, discuss afterwards. Uh, but how can we handle that and keep our analytic position? So if I have to stress at the at the end is I'm talking about the analytic position and I'm worried we are not going to be able to keep it as a discipline, which is really, really worrisome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Jose Carlos Kalish. Thank you to you three. Um, what uh, is clear is that uh, something very deep, huge, wide is changing. Everything is changing. I uh, will first ask you if you want to react the one to the other, the one to the speech and the presentation to the other colleagues between you three. And uh, maybe I can add a first question that is here uh, coming from the audience. And it is also a question regarding that says psychoanalysis is to you the question, but I think it is a question that is useful for you three. Uh, uh, and the question is psychoanalysis will never be the same. You 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 said no, Glenn Gabbard, Dr. Gabbard. And uh, what do you see think about that? And I think that you could. Uh, every one of you take the opportunity to react to the uh, presentation of your colleagues. Uh, do you want me to start, Martina, uh, in answering the question? Yes, you can start. Well, I, I, I think um, that when I said psychoanalysis will never be the same, um, I am making an inference that. The, the change has been so extraordinary in the last few months that we don't know for sure where it's going, but it's very unlikely that it would return to the way it was before the COVID era. Um, I also would say that um, I have a, a somewhat of a, a disagreement, I think, with Giovanni about uh, the, the use of the word intimate um, I think that someone whispering into your ear on a telephone can be very intimate, even though you are in, in different locations. So I, I think I might say, Giovanni, that the intimacy could be different, but I don't think it will be absent. And I'd be interested in what you think of that. I, I, I do think uh, as well that uh, the, the situation that we uh, will deal with in, in the future won't be the same 
even if uh, we we have to work to restore when all these will be finished uh, the the setting as we used to experience it and this will be uh, a, a work uh, against the the the, the easygoing attitudes that uh, 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 will uh, uh, be a, a collective uh, uh, temptation, I would say. The remote work is more, much more comfortable uh, for many uh, aspects, even if, as uh, Jose Carlos mentioned, is much more tiring for uh, the, the the therapist. I. I uh, experienced uh, being uh, uh, exhausted in, in the evening after a day, uh, a daily work, much more than in the past. So it's very engaging for us, but yeah. it may be very uh, comfortable, easygoing for the patient. It won't be diff it won't be easy for us to uh, restore the uh, uh, old way of work. About what you say, Glenn, you are certainly right. Uh, intimacy is uh, something else. Uh, the, 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 the fact of being present uh, in the same room with the body makes uh, the experience uh, 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 special and uh, 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 activates uh, channels of communication that can't be uh, reduced to what uh, happens in uh, online uh, relationship. It looks like intimacy, but it, 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 it is different. This is probably the main problem. Uh, we, we are dealing with uh, something uh, uh, which is uh, fake uh, and, and, and virtual and, uh, and, and uh, uh, tend to uh, uh, make uh, the, the, real the real relationship uh, um, uh, more uh, old-fashioned and uh, and uh, and uh, 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 too materialistic i would say Th this is exactly what uh, uh, jose carlos was uh, speaking about uh, the postmodern idea of uh, freedom without uh, limits without uh, regulation in in a in a ultra liberal way of thinking of uh, uh, human constraints I stop here. Uh, Jose, Jose, Jose Carlos, uh, do you want to react? Uh, yes. Uh, I think this, this sentence that Glenn used, psychoanalysis will never be the same, it depends on what we are talking about. Uh, if you're talking about the formal setting, maybe it's not going to be the same, uh, but it doesn't change the nature of what should be psychoanalysis. And I'm not one to be rigid uh, related to that. I'm just saying that it has to develop through the development of our theories and not by pressure of reality. Uh, if, we, if we are uh, accepting the pressure of reality, uh, we are going to be uh, in a certain way doing the opposite way Freud did. Uh, Freud had to face a very difficult resistance of reality, uh, of his cultural reality, of his environment, of science, to uh, to be able to be in a psychoanalytic position or to start that. And I I think that this can be different in certain ways, in a formal way. Uh, and I think this is not the main difference. In fact, uh, if we psychoanalysts can keep, as I said before, uh, <laughs> can keep our position, uh, this is good enough. Uh, if we can be interested in the inner world and the inner experience of our patients, and instead of being pressured by reality to do something different, uh, I think this could be very useful to all of us. It's going to be another challenge. Uh, so, and the, the other point is about intimacy. I think intimacy is a process. Uh, and as a process, uh, it can happen in different ways. I don't know in a virtual way, because Glenn mentioned the use of the phone, which is a bit different, not a bit, it's different from using uh, virtuality, in fact. Uh, it's, virtuality involves something that is not reality and not fantasy. Uh, uh, 
the telephone is a bit different. Uh, we are talking to a person with certain constraints, but uh, it can be intimate. Uh, I don't know about uh, yet, at least. I don't know yet about what happens in a computer and this kind of images, uh, what kind of intimacy can be here. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but my, I think that most important is psych uh, intimacy is a, is a process and it happens between two persons in different environments. Uh, it used to be on ladders before and it was, there was intimacy also. Thank you. Thank, thank you to you three. I will now read some of the questions coming from the audience. Um, somebody, uh, uh, a lot of, of, of people are, uh, some, 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 um, uh, somebody from Korea um, says, I will read. I would like to ask a question to the panelists. I let all my patients come to my office in person, except during the first months of outbreak of COVID. Most of them like to come to my office in person, but um, uh, uh, we have to wear masks on our face. Some analyst says that it would be better that we meet our patients through the screen that meet them with covering our faces. Which situation do you prefer in their practice during COVID crisis and for what reason? There are also questions about the differences uh, uh, between using the phone and using the image. Uh, uh, we can start with with that part. Then we have more questions. We will start. Giovanni, well, I, I can start. Uh, we have had a, a, a state decision and uh, and uh, regulations coming from the political authority which uh, impeded us uh, to uh, uh, or strongly suggested to avoid direct uh, interaction with patients so we this is the essence of lockdown we have we had to remain uh, in uh, in a in a remote uh, uh, situation uh, i personally uh, left uh, when the social regulation were over, free the patient to decide whether to go on with the uh, uh, um, uh, virtual uh, or telephone uh, interaction or to come to the office. Uh, I think that they have to, 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 to feel themselves safe and, and uh, in the uh, difficult uh, and, and turbulent uh, period of passage between the uh, uh, lockdown and the second and third phase, uh, uh, th they have to be uh, free to decide. This is my uh, attitude. Obviously, I... there are differences, but uh, tell me. I will add, <laughs> just add one word. This uh, prohibition to work personally is only for some country. Here in Spain, it was not like that. You could get, give a, a, a pass to your patient when they want to be here to attend personally. It depends on the countries. Not only the country, but also the region. In, in Italy, yes. the southern part of the country was yes. uh, almost uh, completely free of the infection. And in the region where I live, uh, uh, the, the situation was terrible for many, many uh, weeks. So uh, everybody was imprisoned in the in houses. Uh, I would like to add something. Yes, of course. I, I think it's very hard to say if it's better to work psychoanalytically in person with a mask or by telephone or virtually, because we don't know. Uh, but I I think that 
in any situation, what should be important is the fantasy that the, that the patient is living of seeing us with a mask or with a face shield or uh, <clears throat> by telephone or by a computer. Uh, that's, that's what can make the process goes on. Uh, so I, <clears throat> I cannot imagine uh, to, to find something that can say this is better or not at this moment. Uh, we have in a psychoanalytic process three months is almost nothing so <clears throat> we don't know uh, so I would rather think that in any of these settings uh, we should work with the fantasy of being with a shield or with a mask and or, or with a telephone or with a video to, to be able to get in touch with the inside of of ourselves and of the patients. I would um, agree with what Jose Carlos is saying that we can't lump all of these things together. There are numerous differences in the way people are working right now. And uh, I think it's, it's tempting to say that phone, or virtual is one thing, but it's not one thing. It's a complicated uh, interaction between two people. And as I was saying in, in my opening remarks, uh, there is an idiosyncratic quality to all of these relationships. One could say we're improvising in the way a musician has to improvise because we don't have a score. We don't have a script to follow. We are making it up as we go along so that there's a gradient of different kinds of uh, treatments that are going on under the name of virtual or phone treatment. Uh, regarding the inter interaction with people, uh, we have uh, a lot of questions. Uh, regarding the what kind one is what kind of transfer and counter transfer do we have the other one is what is happening with love and aggressivity online who starts Uh, I can start. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we have a pattern. I don't think we can say there is something that uh, happens with uh, this kind of uh, methodology, with this kind of settings that could be standardized. Uh, I think there are differences. For instance, with obsessive patients, uh, it's more difficult, or with obsess obsessive traits, it's more difficult to be in a telephone or uh, in video, because the obsessive defense uh, uses the distance to make it even strength, uh, so it's more difficult to to work. Uh, to keep an an emotional relation with someone that has a defense against it is maybe more difficult by telephone or, or in video. But I don't think this can be standardized. I don't, I don't think that there's a pattern. Uh, I think with each patient, transference is different and counter-transference is different. Uh, I have some patients that I get more worried. They are not going to be able to keep the treatment uh, by these methods because they, the distance uh, I feel between me and the patient had, uh, in a certain way, been uh, larger than it was before. Uh, I think they are more distance, uh, emotion, uh, they have a more emotional distance from the process. Uh, some others, I do not feel that. So it depends. Uh, I think uh, there are many, many uh, variables. And uh, <clears throat> the only way we can think about that is by singularity, is understanding individually what happens with this patient. And I don't think we have a way of doing patterns. Okay. 
Giovanni, do you want to, yes, to add yes. something? Yes, few words. I think that uh, uh, it's too early to, to, to see differences. Uh, it, it is just the beginning of, of a change. And uh, three months, as uh, was said before, is a very short period. There are differences between uh, the, 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 the patients because of their specific uh, psychic function. But in, in overall, I would say that this is a massive intrusion of the external reality in what you used to think uh, as the setting. And uh, a lot of work uh, uh, has to be done to uh, recreate uh, the situation that uh, help uh, the dyer that to focus on the inner reality, which is the specific dimension of our work. I would stay. Uh, I would stop here. Oh. Glenn, do you want to add something, or can I can I bring another yes. question? I'd like to add something to the discussion. Um, one of, one of the part of the question was about the counter transferences, uh, and I um, I think that the counter transferences I am struggling with have to do with the setting itself. Like, am I introducing too much um, kind of give and take conversation? A, a very common problem I've encountered is the patient comes in and wants to talk about the pandemic and they'll tell me what they saw on the news. And I, I will feel some uh, wish to join in discussing that because we are both trying to ease our anxieties and I'll have to sort of back off from that and get into uh, what I would call a more analytic process. I think that there is a counter transference anxiety and fear because we don't know where this is going and what it is that's quite different than what I've experienced throughout my long career. Um, uh, there are very interesting uh, questions. One is about uh, our own fear, our vulnerability. Uh, how can we, what can we say about that? Uh, can this increase our intimacy with the patient? I read the, the question. The patient can prefer the office, but the analyst can feel most secure at home. Can it be useful to the patient to discuss it? It is one of the questions. The other question is, uh, well, um, is, uh, uh, worried about uh, the um, uh, the uh, necessary uh, the necessity of uh, intimacy and uh, mm, well i think we can we can we can start with this one the vulnerability of the analyst the fear of the analyst Yes, Giovanni. Uh, the, the situation created by the pandemic is uh, exceptional, and uh, we are uh, both uh, the patient and the analyst put in a so uncommon and strange situation that uh, uh, augment the uh, tragic dimension of life. We, we, we know that we have to die, but this situation has uh, put the experience of seeing people that we love dying or being in danger in a uh, foreground uh, as, a, as a present danger. Uh, and, and this uh, creates a, a very peculiar uh, type of relationship where both uh, the, the analyst and, uh, and, uh, and the patient 
feel vulnerable and and feel vulnerable the the loved ones of of their lives and this is uh, uh, both uh, something which makes uh, the, the 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 psychoanalytic standard position uh, more difficult but also uh, easier easy uh, to 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 think about uh, what uh, really matters in life uh, we, we will see in the future what uh, will happen with this intensity is uh, at the same time a fake intensity caused by the peculiar in some way artificial situation but also something that has put us in the situation of facing the uh, most extreme experiences of life yes jose carlos calis yeah. I would like to add something. Uh, I think it's uh, it's a very difficult uh, concept that we should be understanding better. This one of intimacy, because uh, sharing a vulnerability does not mean intimacy. In fact, uh, if we share something, we share something that we both are feeling. Uh, we share uh, we share fear. We share a pleasure. Uh, this this kind of uh, identification uh, it's different from intimacy, uh, <clears throat> and intimacy is a very complex uh, concept because there are many pseudo intimacy uh, attitudes and postures that the postmodern world uh, considers as intimacy, and they are pseudo intimacy. I cannot consider that sharing. Uh, a vulnerability is intimacy. The intimacy would be be able to understand the meaning of the intimacy in our relation. Uh, if the patient is perceiving my, is feeling, perceiving, uh, uh, considering, talking about my vulnerability, uh, then it's different. We, we can talk about it and we can give meaning for that. We can give meaning for the relation with our vulnerabilities, which is going to be different. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, it's different. There's there's a sentence that uh, of a, uh, a Spanish writer uh, that says the tempest is the same, but the boat is different. Uh, and that's where we are. The tempest is the same. We are in the same tempest, but we are <clears throat> in a different boat. So. Uh, it will never be the same. The vulnerability is never going to be the same. Uh, maybe the the patient will feel we are not more humans, uh, but I I really don't think that this is a, this is something that uh, reveals anything. It reveals probably that Danvers has a position that he was not felt as human, uh, but uh, this also has to be worked in the transference and the trans transference counter transference relationship. Uh, Glenn, do you want to add something, or I yes. can also? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I think the um, anxiety is pervasive in this situation. Um, anyone who said, I have no anxiety whatsoever about the pandemic, would be in some form of denial or hypomanic defense. And one of the huge problems we see in the United States is many young adults in their 20s and 30s go out to bars and restaurants mm -hmm. and drink and have dinner as though there's nothing wrong, as though the pandemic is a myth. And of course, this is uh, partly supported by the idea that you can't see it, touch it, hear it. It it comes out of nowhere and strikes you. But right now, in the southern states of the U.S., we have this uptick, huge uptick in the um, number of uh, infections. And a lot of it has to do with this uh, refusal to accept science, even many of the leaders 
don't accept science either. So that uh, I think we are seeing uh, a massive denial and, uh, as I say, a kind of manic defense against what everybody is worried about. And I would say the defense to me is just as worrying as the pandemic itself. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, acceleration. It is happening the same here in my country. I will raise another question that uh, is coming from Churcher, John Churcher, and I read the question. Given that confidentiality is an essential <clears throat> condition of psychoanalysis, how has you awareness of the insecurity of modern telecommunications affected your cl clinical practice and your understanding of the setting that you are able to offer to your patients when working remotely? The IPA has just uh, published a, a, a thick and uh, very well done document about confidentiality. And, uh, and we all know that uh, with using these uh, channels, confidentiality is uh, a, a, a very uh, difficult uh, uh, problem, almost uh, impossible to be solved. Uh, so uh, we, we, we uh, in, in my uh, decision, I decided to discuss openly the issue with the patient and uh, to uh, decide together which kind of channel uh, use. Uh, a lot of uh, patients uh, uh, preferred the, the telephone, uh, which is also something that uh, uh, avoids the problem of eye contact. The psychoanalytic patients are not used to, 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 to use that uh, uh, way of, uh, of dealing with the, with the therapist. Some uh, other patients have uh, decided to use a, a Zoom, for instance, but closing the camera after the uh, sharing of uh, the beginning and opening it again at the end. I, I know that this is not the answer that uh, John Churchill is uh, uh, looking for. I, I think that uh, this is a, an impossible issue and uh, it has to be shared with the, with the patient. Mm -hmm. In the emergency situation, we, we had to do choices and this seemed to me the best choice to discuss the thing openly with the patient. Thank you very much Giovanni. Uh, uh, I have another question there <laughs> that's right. Could you, the panel please say something more about new trends, new training, new curriculums, new ideas, new faces, new partnerships, new research question. The title of the, the webinar is New Trends, and I underline that. I, yeah, I, and I, I think what we have been talking about is yes. we are all uh, trying to forge new ways of working in a kind of improvisational way, because this is new for, for us and we are uh, making it up as we go along and finding what, what form of interaction with the patient is best in which situation. And I would have to say it varies quite a bit among my patients as to what they prefer. And you know, some of the patients who are on uh, the uh, a Zoom with me like to move their chair so that they're not looking and they find that more comfortable. And uh, I think another uh, thing we have to consider about new ways of working is are we doing something because we prefer it or have we asked the patient about what the patient prefers and is there some kind of middle ground where we could make compromises? Um, and, you know, I think we are all learning this in the last three months as to 
which approach seems most compatible with the patient, but the analyst's viewpoint also has to be taken into account. The two people need to be in a situation where they can listen, associate, and uh, feel like they're connecting with one another. So it's, it's a very broad, new uh, uh, landscape that we're, we're talking about, and it's hard to come, come back with a, a succinct answer to how we're dealing with it. But I would very much like to hear what my colleagues think. Uh, again, I think it's very early to, to say what's going to happen or what changes we are going to have. Uh, <clears throat> it's very early. Uh, so changes in curriculum, changes in the way we think about psychoanalysis, uh, it cannot, nothing can, can be said at this moment. Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, what will remain from this crisis, from this situation? Uh, <clears throat> For sure, things that we have, uh, sufferings that we have personally passed, people that we have lost, uh, uh, especially people very close, uh, we are going to remember that forever. Uh, but not for the crisis. We are going to remember that because we lost someone who was important for us. Uh, as every crisis, I think the tendency will be to forget uh, the what happens at this moment is important at this moment. If you remember what happened in World War, uh, uh, Churchill said, please photograph everything because nobody's going to believe and every, everybody is going to forget what happened here. Uh, and that's what happens. I think in, in 10 years or 20 years, uh, this crisis uh, is not going to be remembered anymore as a crisis. For, for sure, there could be consequences. Uh, but our tendency is to forget by defense, by desire, by drive, it doesn't matter. But the tendency is to forget. So what's going to happen, it depends on the change of the group mentality. Uh, and this is so, something so complicated to know at this moment. Uh, we'll have to wait uh, maybe some years to understand what changes we are going to have. And then we can talk about what should be changed. Uh, if there's something that should be changed. Uh, uh, for sure, this this formal setting, uh, working remotely, is going to be there. Uh, we now know we can work, but we don't know, as we said before, uh, in what extent it is a good or a bad process, it's better or not, but it's there. So it's probably going to remain. But I don't think this is something that at this moment, should be the most important question, uh, mainly because we cannot answer it. Uh, we don't have an answer. What's going to happen? Uh, I think that uh, uh, the, the the newest experience I have uh, witnessed uh, in in these weeks are about the teaching. Uh, the, the the teaching can be uh, not not only uh, as good as uh, in the in the in the personal relationship, but there are also things that can be done that uh, couldn't be done before. Uh, before the few minutes before the beginning of this panel, I was discussing with a colleague working in uh, in Germany that will take part to the lesson that uh, uh, I will uh, have with the candidates tomorrow. And uh, uh, we will discuss uh, 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 an issue together that, that the candidates are very interested in seeing senior analysts discussing together uh, a controversial issue. And uh, this is something that uh, uh, can be done uh, in a very easy way with uh, the new platform that, uh, that we have. I think that uh, this uh, uh, will change the teaching uh, uh, of seminars and lessons uh, in a permanent way. Obviously, there are also disadvantages in, in doing this, but uh, uh, I am sure that the methodology will be mixed in the future. We will be partly in person and, and partly in, uh, in using these uh, kind of, uh, of uh, channels 
to uh, to to have uh, uh, the the dialogue that uh, can uh, make the uh, teaching uh, more interesting uh, uh, more uh, easily uh, realized and then also the the group supervisions uh, can can be uh, developed uh, the the person and individual supervision uh, uh, are uh, easily done and uh, and uh, uh, quickly uh, organized uh, with uh, colleagues that are in uh, 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 in a very distant uh, setting in, a, in in different languages and cultures and this is something that uh, with the change of mentality that uh, is uh, going on uh, become uh, more more frequent I, I i am sure so we have to differentiate as i said between the the, the clinical work uh, the 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 supervision the teaching and the, the institutional work do you want to add something Carlos no. Glenn. No, I have another question. Uh, in fact, about the training for the candidates uh, that speak about the lockdown, and this person says we had to start analysis with new patient remotely. Would you think, in long term, this will bring some flexibility for the worldwide analytic? training uh, there is another question uh, that is also asking if you are thinking that ipa will uh, change some points about uh, the training from for the analyst uh, after this crisis Well, I, I think it's very likely the American Psychoanalytic Association has already uh, changed um, the um, understanding of what is currently going on in a training analysis to virtual or um, uh, other uh, other modes like the phone, uh, which have not been authorized before, but now they're seen as essential. And like all of my colleagues are saying, we're at the beginning of this. So far, we we're seeing changes, but we don't know really where it will go. But but certainly, there will be much greater flexibility in what constitutes a psychoanalytic treatment. The others? I think that the, the IPA uh, will uh, promote uh, a, a, a discussion about uh, the uh, different experimentation in different settings and, uh, uh, and also uh, try to promote a, a dialogue between uh, the different traditions and and the different institutional organization of the, of the training there is also a, already a huge debate on on this and i think that the, the 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 situation the present situation which is shaking our uh, ideas and and the, the organizational structure will make the the, the dialogue uh, uh, even uh, uh, more intense and vital uh, we will see but uh, the the ipa is uh, fully equipped for rediscussing and re-establishing uh, uh, our collective rules on a different basis uh, I would, i'd like to add something different uh, i think this uh, this idea that is binary between uh, flexibility and rigidity is not a good discussion uh, uh, this makes things uh, look like they are less complex than they are uh, it's not it's not a question of flexibility or a question of rigidity it's why doing the changes what are the reasons to make a change 
uh, and to, to be able to dialogue and, and reflect on what is happening and why we are changing things. Uh, so for sure we have something new. Uh, this has to be thought. Uh, this has to be understood. Uh, we have to have we have to discuss, we have to have congresses on that, we have to uh, to have many years of publishing things. Uh, but I don't think that the idea of flexibility and rigidity uh, is, is a good part of the discussion. Uh, otherwise, everything that is flexible is good and everything that is rigid is bad. Uh, this is binary. And this is a problem of our postmodern way of thinking that we polarize the thinking and say that the other is ridiculous, uh, which is not good. Uh, so my point is, we better we better think about why we should change and what we should change for what reasons, uh, and then think about changes. Say yes, Giovanni. I agree with Jose. Uh, the, the the binary uh, distinction is uh, just the beginning of the reasoning, and uh, and then we have to go on and compare carefully uh, the, the 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 different experiences uh, uh, and and uh, and uh, the pros and cons of every situation. Glenn Gavar, do you want to add? Anything? Uh, yes, I, I think I said earlier that innovation is uh, really essential at this point, and that requires some flexibility, but also maintaining the long standing aspects of analysis that we think makes it effective. And that's sort of the challenge we face now is integrating change with certain kinds of long-standing uh, elements of analysis that are necessary to make an analytic treatment. So I think we are near the end and I will take three seconds to say um, how much uh, I enjoy this kind of webinar with persons, uh, famous analysts coming from uh, a lot of parts of the world and debating, bringing new ideas. This is an opportunity we didn't have before, or at least I didn't enjoy that kind of, uh, of activity. I enjoy very, very much this webinar since the beginning, since the, the crisis. So for me, it has been a very great initiative. Uh, so every good thing has a hand. So uh, I thank you very much for, for your rich apports, uh, apportations. Uh, your presentation, the ideas uh, that you raise in your debates, and thank you, you three, Glenn Gaba, Giovanni Foresti, Juan Carlos Calic. It has been a pleasure and a wonderful experience to be able to listen to you and to share that. Thank you uh, for the presentation you offered giving us the possibility to think deeper our present world, psychic world, and our profession. But as you underlined a lot, Jose Carlos, uh, we have a lot of work to do. We have also to, to thank the initiative of the IPA, IP, thank you to the IPA president, Virginia Ungar, to the IPA vice president, Sergio Nick, the IPA board, for this initiative uh, of the webinars that makes possible to be in touch in a moment of isolation. Thank you to the webinar committee 
and to Sylvia Wachbuch uh, for a huge work and help, and help as coordinator. Thank you, of course, to the valuable IPA work staff and its patients' help. I think that uh, we will now announce the up upcoming mm, webinars. It will take place on Friday, July the 3rd. Uh, it, it will be in Portuguese. Um, it, uh, it is Como Criaremos o Amanhã. Uh, I don't know the pronunciation, Rose Carlos. Maybe you can read the title better than no, I. It was good enough. Uh, how are you going to create tomorrow? The tomorrow. Okay. And uh, we will also uh, announce. Uh, can I? Can we have the slide, uh, uh, Matthew? Uh, yes, um, you know that uh, the IP has uh, a page uh, named Coronavirus Stay Connected, be part of the conversation with other members and candidates, take a look at the support and resource available. Um, you our COVID-19 uh, resource page contains I'm reading papers and articles, journals, recommendations for remote analysis, videos, guidance and advice. Uh, I also wanted to announce the uh, next IPA Congress uh, with, with the title The Infantile, it's multiple dimensions it will take a place i hope it will be possible next year in vancouver and next july 2021 in vancouver thank you very much uh, to the presenters to the ipa and to the audience